In this video, I will introduce the formal definition of limit. I will assume that before this one, you have watched the three videos in which I explain the intuitive idea of limit geometrically and the video where I talk about absolute values and distance. Let's begin. This is my starting point. When I say that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l, I'm thinking of a function like the one in this graph. Perhaps it's not even defined at a, and the graph has a hole at a, but it's nice when I'm approaching a. Roughly, the idea I had was that if x is close to a, but not a, then f of x is close to l. And I want to take this rough idea and rewrite it into something formal that has a very precise minute. I don't care what happens at a. Perhaps it has a hole, perhaps it's defined with the wrong value, perhaps it doesn't have a hole at all. I'm going to treat all those the same way, and I'm going to be thinking of something like the one in the picture. So let me take this rough idea and let's examine it part by part and try to formalize it. First, how do I write that x is close to a? Well, I can say that the distance between x and a is small, and according to the video on absolute values, that's the same thing as saying the absolute value of x minus a is small. But the small is not a precise term. So instead, I'm going to say the absolute value of x minus a is smaller than delta. I'm choosing the Greek letter delta here. I could have chosen any other letter. It's traditional to use delta. And then there's going to be some kind of measurement, some kind of cutoff that tells me what small means. I will have to explain what that means later. But for now, if I choose delta some small number, the absolute value of x minus a being smaller than that means that they are close. I also need to say that x is not equal to a. What I'm going to do is add a second inequality and say the absolute value of x minus a is greater than zero because the only way that absolute value could be zero is when x equals a. So that is there simply to exclude the case x equals a. And now, the statement at the top is a conditional. So if x is close to a but not a, that means if the distance between x and a is between zero and delta, then f of x is close to l. So I'm going to say that the distance between f of x and l is small, smaller than epsilon. I'm going to choose a second cutoff, a second way to measure what it means to be a small. This implication is going to be a piece in the definition of limit, but now I need to think hard and figure out what do I actually mean by delta and by epsilon. I have some idea that they should be a small numbers, so that they represent the idea that x is close to a and f of x is close to l, but exactly what I still need to figure out. Next, I will put this in the context of a properly written definition. I'm going to say that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l when this implication is true. But as I've written it, this is neither right nor wrong, this is meaningless because there are so many letters I haven't defined. I need to explain what all the pieces of notation mean. I'll take care of the issue ones first. L and A are two real numbers that I need to fix before the definition even starts. So let A and L be real numbers. And F should be a function. Now, in order to study this limit, I don't care if F of A is defined or not. But F needs to be defined for values of X close to A. So I'm going to say that f is a function defined at least on an interval center at a, except maybe at a. It may or may not be defined. This is better. Now I still need to explain what I'm doing with epsilon and delta. Let's look at those. I'm going to look at a few examples of graphs of functions that do or do not have a limit to understand what the implication means geometrically and what conditions I need to ask about delta and epsilon. The if part says that the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta. So x must be in this interval, but not be a. And the then part says the distance between f of x and l is smaller than epsilon. So f of x is in this interval. So whenever x is in this interval, but not a, f of x is in this interval. In other words, I'm in this region, and these two other regions are forbidden. As long as I avoid these two regions, I will satisfy the implication. Notice that for other values of x, there are no constraints, and f of x can be anything. For example, the function with this graph satisfies the implication for the specific value of epsilon and the specific value of delta that I chose in the picture. I want to figure out what I need to say about delta and epsilon. I hope it is clear that we are not asking for the implication to be true for all values of epsilon and all values of delta. There are pairs of values for which this won't work. But it is also not enough to request the implication for just one value of delta and one value of epsilon. Let's look at an example of a function that doesn't have a limit for comparison. Here is the graph of a function that does not have a limit at a. So these examples should fail the definition. Now for the specific value of delta and the specific value of epsilon in the picture, the function satisfies the implication because the graph avoids the forbidden regions.
So which values of epsilon and delta will notice that this function doesn't have a limit? I have an idea that I want small delta and small epsilon because the distances should be small. Now, making delta small is not going to help. Look at it. No matter how small I make delta, this function is going to continue satisfying the implication. In fact, making delta smaller makes it easier to satisfy the implication because it narrows the forbidden region. On the other hand, if I make epsilon small, if I make epsilon small enough, then eventually I will notice that this function fails to have a limit. So in order to capture that this function doesn't have a limit and the other one does, I need to look at values of epsilon specifically small. I'm going to request that this is true for all values of epsilon positive. And when I say for all, I mean small. I kind of wish I could say for the smallest positive value of epsilon, but there is no smallest positive value of epsilon. I cannot make epsilon zero and there is no smallest positive real. So that's why I say I want the implication to be true for all epsilon. But in my mind, I'm thinking I'm going to take values of epsilon small and smaller and smaller and as small as possible and see if those still work. And then for every value of epsilon, I don't need lots of values of delta. I just need one single value of delta for its value of epsilon. So I'm going to request that for every value of epsilon, there exists one value of delta that makes the implication true. Let's see what this means. In this example, in the example that has a limit, for this value of epsilon, there is one value of delta that works. If I make epsilon smaller, I will have to change delta, but there will be another value of delta also smaller than works. And if I make epsilon even smaller, well, I can find a value of delta even smaller than works. And no matter how small epsilon is, I can find a value of delta that makes the implication work. By contrast, let's look at the bad example, the function without a limit. In this case, for this value of epsilon, there is a value of delta that works. If I take a smaller value of epsilon, maybe there is still a smaller value of delta that works. But if I take a value of epsilon that's very small, so that the interval is only this, then no value of delta works. For that value of epsilon, all values of delta fails. Great! This definition is going to realize that this function doesn't have a limit and the previous one has a limit. There we have it. This is the formal definition of limit. Hooray! It looks a bit complex, but unfortunately there is no way to simplify it. If you omit any little part, if you modify it a little, chances are you will drastically change the meaning and it will no longer mean what we understand as limit. I recommend that you don't memorize this as a string of symbols, but that you make sure you understand why every little piece of the definition is necessary. There's a much better way to memorize it. I need to add one very important comment though. The second line is an implication, an if-then statement. If the distance between x and a is between zero and delta, then the distance between f of x and l is smaller than epsilon. And when I write an if-then statement like this, there is a hidden implied quantifier. When I write this conditional, I'm saying this conditional is true for every real value x. So we could as well just put in there for every x in the reals. And we probably should, probably could make things simpler or more clear. But unfortunately, it is a standard convention to assume that this for all x in the reals is implied and not write it explicitly. Choose whatever you want. If it's going to make you less confused, put it explicitly. If you're comfortable, then put it. But remember that is there, even if only implied. To conclude, I will leave you with an exercise. The best way to make sure that you understood this definition is see if you can generalize it. In previous videos, I've introduced other notions, like limit on the left, limit on the right, or a limit being infinity. If you understood this video, now you can take those geometric ideas and try to rewrite them as rigorous definitions. And if you succeed, it means you understand the formal definition of limit well.